Good morning and welcome to today's program on Facebook Live. My name is Joe Masabni, Extension Vegetable Specialist at Dallas Center. Thanks to those who have joined me in the past uh, in this uh, continuing series of the Dallas Vegetable Garden and welcome to those new ones who are uh, just joining recently. Uh, today, I will be sharing with you my story of activities, the good, the bad, and ugly of uh, things I've seen, I've done during the month of uh, June of 2022. On June 1st, one of my squash plants looked wilted like this. Uh, you know, uh, all the plants around it were healthy. Nothing wrong with this, definitely something wrong with the roots. When a plant looks fine in the morning and uh, wilted in the afternoon, usually that's an indication of uh, squash vine border. And it was fine in the morning and wilted in the afternoon. So I take a close look at the crown area, you know, where the stem was is on the ground level. And I saw that it had cracked and opened in the past. And then you can see that it's uh, uh, starting to uh, heal here. You know, the callus uh, started to heal, but then the wind or something uh, broke it off. Now, why the stem split? I cannot see any evidence of uh, like insect frass. You know, that's a fancy word for insect poop or anything. So I don't know why it split or why it cracked. But anyway, that plant was just barely touching the ground and it's time to uh, dispose of it and get rid of it. So, always nice to get some help when you're harvesting. Um, this is Dr. New uh, helping me harvest the squash and the kale and the Swiss chard um, early in the season. Here you see the multi pick yellow squash and the calabasa uh, squash uh, variety name is Magda. And I also had uh, zucchini and then uh, Italian variety called Pantheon. And everybody here at the center, they said that they like this for uh, this uh, type of squash, the 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 calabasa type squash. Uh, it's just that the skin uh, is very tender, tender, and it's in scar very easy. You see all these uh, uh, scratches here. So uh, commercial growers uh, hate growing this because it can scratch very easy compared to zucchini or yellow squash, but it tastes great. On June 5th, uh, I've shown you before and I've talked uh, before many times and I continue to encourage growers on suckering plants, meaning removing the lower leaves up to uh, like almost the first cluster. So you see here on the left, uh, the row before suckering, and then on the right, after it was suckered, you see you remove any old leaves that are yellow touching the ground that have a potential of catching soil-borne diseases like uh, buckeye rot, like uh, early blight, you know, anything that can uh, start and kill, kill the plants from the bottom up. Uh, uh, those old leaves are useless. They're not helping the fruits. Um, and it gives you more aeration, uh, you know, for uh, more air movement to move and uh, help the plant. And at the same time, you can get rid of any weeds that you see uh, while you're doing that. It's a great idea. Um, uh, just search for uh, tomato suckering for, for details online or watch my previous videos where I showed you the steps on how to do it. And here is a, a view on June 5th on how the tomato looked very nice at that time. Uh, big potential loaded with fruits, loaded with flowers. And this row here is before suckering and this row here after suckering. So definitely a great way of keeping the plants healthy. That's June uh, 5th. You can see by end of June uh, how, remember the theme of this presentation is the good, the bad, and ugly. This is the good on June 5th. Very promising. I'm going to get a 20 pounds per plant. Uh, and then and then disaster hits. And this is how much I got uh, of old leaves. This is a, a three-foot uh, barrel 
the three foot tall and you can see how much uh, leaves I uh, disposed. Uh, that don't put it in the compost pile because you never know what uh, diseases will carry from one year to another. Uh, I prefer that you can uh, dispose of it in the trash. Next thing uh, happened and uh, first I thought it was uh, aphids or mites but then the the type of damage and the, the, the how long it lasted gave me uh, a strong feeling of that it might be thrips, which is typical uh, disease, insect problem that comes in. You see symptoms for two or three weeks, and then whether the insects, the thrips die out or move out, um, uh, and then the new growth uh, gets better. If it was mites, the problem will get worse and worse. But this here, and you see all kind of symptoms where, you know, deformation, uh, and uh, uh, that tells me like something is feeding and disturbing the, the normal uh, uh, leaf expansion and cell growth, so it grows uh, wrinkled and crooked. If it kept getting worse and worse, that would have been mites. But I looked everywhere, I didn't see sign of mites. And the new growth got better, like you see here. So that tells me that it was thrips. You just, uh, I sprayed insecticidal soap. Uh, I hope what I sprayed got rid of it. Uh, or like I said, sometimes they move in and then they uh, die out or move out. Uh, and, uh, and my plants got better. So that tells me it's not a virus. It's uh, not mites, since I did not see any evidence of the mites. And, uh, and uh, most likely it is strips. We move now to June 7, a couple of days later. And uh, shown here the trellis that I built. And I let the kabocha and the cantaloupe climb on it. Um, in the background, you see the pile of mulch and a little bit left of the compost that was used in the garden. Uh, and you'll see this here, the gate with that gap that has been the bane of my uh, uh, existence. I have uh, three of these small gates and I also built a 10 foot wide gate and the gap here is big enough for rabbits. Uh, just today, uh, I saw holes on the inside of the garden uh, of uh, something that looks like a rabbit trying to get out. So after I fixed all the gates and I closed them well, that uh, there I have a rabbit uh, stuck inside the garden uh, trying to get out. So that's not our next big project is to open all the gates and try to flush them out or, uh, or do something because he's eating uh, my uh, cantaloupes. Uh, so far, uh, four cantaloupes have ripened and uh, I'm just feeding the cantaloupes to the rabbit. But anyway, this is what you see here is, is that uh, hog panel, three foot wide by t uh, 16 foot long that I just bent. And I, I had two T-posts on this side uh, to support it on this side and, and the fence to support it on this side and some zip ties and I have an in instant trellis and uh, train the vine to climb on top of that. One thing you need to remember if you do this, is to make sure that the fruits are not stuck in between these uh, gaps because I had both uh, um, uh, kabocha squash and cantaloupe uh, stuck in between that hole and you couldn't uh, pull them out. You just had to cut the fruit in half uh, to harvest them. Anyway, they look nice. It's a great way to grow a vining plant in your garden with the least expense with, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, just uh, see here's the two T-posts, uh, uh, four zip ties on, uh, on each side and uh, a hog panel. So the cost of about $50-$60 uh, removable uh, if you don't want it uh, they are permanent. At this time the kabocha looked uh, very well, very healthy at this time, uh, at uh, early June, but uh, you'll see in just what couple of weeks uh, can do. And here's uh, the other uh, uh, trellis with the kabocha. Um, and um, 
switching to the first tomato harvest, I wanted to show you uh, that uh, tomatoes is climacteric, meaning that it will continue ripening after harvest as long as the fruit is physiologically mature. So don't be misled if you see uh, something called vine ripened because this is vine ripened because it's physiologically ripe on the vine at harvest. Uh, so field tomato coming from California looks like this because by the time it arrives here it looks like this. So you see here what a three day difference between these three varieties uh, did. Now many hydroponic uh, tomatoes nowadays growing in greenhouses they allow them to turn red um, in the, on the vine before they're picked and harvest but those are different varieties and they're like cherry and grape type tomatoes See, this is grape type tomato and this is called cherry type tomato. Um, uh, and uh, those, um, uh, sometimes they're uh, tough, they don't get soft when they are ripe, so they're suitable for that. You don't see um, uh, beefsteak tomato um, that are allowed to ripen on the vine, turn red on the vine before harvest. Uh, Ruby Crush was the most uh, favored variety that we tasted and I grew and everybody uh, enjoyed that fla uh, its flavor. And this is close up of the cantaloupe that's growing on the trellis. Lots of fruits. This is how they start and this is when they're a little bit bigger. I was worried that they, I have to support them somehow so they don't fall from their own weight, but I've harvested fruits that are, uh, you know, uh, four pounds, three pounds, four pounds, uh, and um, uh, hanging, hanging there and they supported themselves. Of course, I ended up feeding it to the rabbits because the rabbit got to it before uh, I got to it and I harvested uh, four cantaloupes so far with holes in them. So. Uh, and this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, if you grow them like this, pay attention and make sure the fruits, when they are small, they are not stuck in, in, in this frame here because when they are stuck, uh, you just have to cut it open, uh, cut it in half to remove it. I've seen videos, YouTube videos, where people put uh, cantaloupes, even small uh, baby watermelon, in a, in a, in a box and then the cantaloupe and the watermelon grows to be a square shape or a bottle shape. So that's something if you like to play and have some fun gardening, uh, you can definitely experiment with, uh, with that. And it doesn't affect the flavor, doesn't affect everything. But I think it looks great if, if, you have, if you start growing and selling square cantaloupes. Uh, watch videos very popular uh, in Japan selling uh, square uh, watermelon. You see the fruit will adapt to the f uh, volume that it's stuck in and it, uh, it does not have to grow uh, round. Uh, only. On June 14, life is good. Everything, uh, life was really good. The squash were good. Uh, the uh, parsley and cilantro and the sorrel uh, Swiss chard and kale, four varieties of squash. Behind me are the two cantaloupe and the kabocha. No signs of in, no signs of uh, diseases, uh, insects. I've uh, thinned uh, the foliage uh, here. Um, I trimmed the leaves of the squash. Also, um, just the garden looked very good. Very few weeds maybe one here in the alleyways. Remember that I am struggling and I will struggle all this season with uh, perennial weeds that are growing through the one foot of mulch and one foot of compost, but uh, uh, next year will be better. Uh, even the tomatoes uh, on this end where they had a little bit of mites uh, are under control because the new growth is fine. Peppers look great. Everything looked great. Here's a close-up of the peppers. Uh, this whole row is corno di toro, uh, sweet pepper, but these two rows here uh, are uh, like 15 varieties, uh, different varieties of pepper, and I'll show you harvest and some numbers uh, of that. Um, 
plenty of uh, plenty of fruits, plenty of flowers. A great indication for a bountiful harvest. I had the irrigation on a timer. They were watered three times a day, each time half hour. So the plants, uh, and I have here the tensiometer, tensiometer. You can look it up. Uh, commercial growers use that so this way they don't uh, guess when to water of course three times a day uh, 20 minutes or half hours each is more than enough I've never uh, this tensiometer never showed me an indication that uh, the plants are stressed or needed watering actually I may ha I know I have been over watering because I have some uh, cracked fruits because the tomato fruit uh, the skin is a like a plastic bag is not porous so you add too much water the fruits uh, can absorb so much water uh, before it cracks open because it cannot breathe out and uh, let some of that water pass through the skin the skin is non porous so if you have a cracked fruit it's one of two things your watering is irregular like you watering every five days the fruit had uh, uh, got stress the skin got hard and then you add a lot of water and it cannot expand and it cracked or you're watering regularly but too much and then you the fruit will crack too and and what I had was the second cause of watering too much on June 17 uh, I'm to uh, show you what I did uh, on the squash trimming old leaves uh, this is before and after I removed the old leaves and I'll show you a video uh, let's see how it works and we can listen to it together and this is all the leaves excess leaves that I have removed you can see some of uh, the oldest leaves are not needed um, uh, why keep them it's an opportunity to check the stem see if you have holes from squash vine border it's a chance to remove some of the weeds around the plant and a chance to bury the stem that uh, you bared from the old leaves uh, to make it root and uh, and cover it in case to, to protect it from future uh, squash vine border uh, in, infestation okay so and he, let's here's the video let's watch it together so I am spending time removing the lower leaves of my squash just like I did for the Pantheon or and for the uh, Noche this is multi pick and uh, this is a so here's a recap that uh, you see here's the vine and uh, the old the old leaves are just sitting there waiting uh, to catch a disease they're useless they get old, they start losing color, they potentially start getting some uh, powdery mildew which can infect the rest of the plant. So remove them. Here, as the vine grows, the, the tip is where the youngest leaves are, you know, and the flowers and the fruit. So why you need old leaves? And it's a great opportunity when you do this to inspect, to inspect the crown area and see if you have um, uh, uh, squash vine border here the stem is split that's not a disease it just splits by itself so that's fine so as I was doing this uh, and you know so here's one that after it's done see how much clean versus before very crowded too many old sick leaves versus younger uh, all young healthy leaves and a clean crown now this happens once in a while a fruit like this that aborts it just did not get pollinated properly uh, something must have happened during that period when the flower was ready it happens once in a once in a occasional fruit like this as I was doing this I reached here where the plants are very weak because they were shaded heavily by uh, the kabocha before I built the trellis and uh, lifted them up. So these plants are okay, but they are a third of the size of the plants there. So I'm going to take them out of their misery. Okay, don't be the eternal optimist 
and value every plant like it is God's gift to humanity. Take it out of its misery. You want production. You want quality plants. You, want, you don't want this weak plant uh, just sitting there and taking space. So these four are gone, cleaned up the space. Now there's a big buffer. This is not gonna compete with that and these squash are not gonna compete with this. So in addition to thrips, which was temporary problem, in addition to mites, my third problem that I'm still dealing with as of today are rabbits. Remember the garden was neglected for uh, years. There's lots of rabbits at the center. They're growing wild and crazy and I'm giving them the ideal environment and uh, with, in terms of plenty of water and plenty, plenty of food. So instead of foraging outside, they can come and get uh, come inside and they nibbled on my tomatoes. They nibbled on uh, peppers, but they only uh, chewed uh, and ate the seeds that are inside the pepper. They didn't care for the fruit, the skin. The seed is where the protein is, so they were eating the seed. And here is one of the rabbit problems that you see here. So um, the first thing I did in the morning was get my exercise, um, uh, running around, trying to chase them, open all the gates and try to chase them from one place to another so they can get out and close the gate behind, behind them. So uh, thank you, rabbits. I got the chance to uh, run for five, five, 10 minutes every morning trying to chase you out. I did fix the gates. Now I have another problem. I did fix the gate and I fixed them so well. So now I have a rabbit stuck inside uh, that uh, cannot get out. Um, I, from the so many holes I see around the fence trying to dig its, uh, its way out. So uh, that's our next project is to open all the gates and try to chase it out. And hopefully when we close it again, he cannot go back in. But you see here, um, that is before I fixed the gate. I put a big board here and some more uh, uh, chicken wire, but uh, they dig and they enter. And even a baby rabbit can uh, squeeze itself in. You know, two inches uh, sometimes is enough uh, to squeeze in. Uh, when you're flexible and you're desperate to go inside for uh, food and water. And uh, that's what it did. I mean, uh, I harvested and I weighed and counted all the fruits, but my numbers are way below uh, reality because I lost a lot of fruits uh, to uh, to the rabbits. And that's how, you know, damage look here. Yeah, and they didn't uh, wait for the fruits uh, to get ripe. Uh, if they could reach it, even if it was still green, uh, they went after it. and interestingly is that uh, I planted here parsley and I planted here cilantro uh, and they prefer parsley over cilantro they you know they raised uh, grazed it to the ground they did not touch the cilantro uh, now if do you think if I plant uh, parsley here in the middle of surrounded by cilantro will that uh, uh, confuse them or trick them? No, they can smell it and they can jump inside and eat the parsley that's inside. So uh, this is a failed experiment. Uh, anyway, the parsley and the cilantro were transplanted way too late. They're very stressed. I mean, the cilantro is still surviving, but it looks just like this uh, three, four weeks after I transplanted out. So it's just barely surviving. The only way to plant uh, to succeed if you transplant late, you know, like uh, 1st of June, is to uh, put some uh, white fabric over them or some kind of shade cloth uh, to protect them from uh, the heat of the sun, uh, um, you know, so they're not very stressed and hopefully they can grow. Or plant them very early in the spring or plant them in the fall. There's uh, nothing to be planted here. Uh, I'm thinking of putting some uh, cowpeas and okra, but I have uh, lots of other beds. Uh, if I need to, I will replace uh, the parsley and cilantro with uh, different varieties of okra. Uh, this is the um, Noche Zucchini. Um, they're very good yielder. And this is what beetle insect uh, feeding damage looks like. Uh, for a homeowner, if you want to be organic, if you want to be sustainable, you have to tolerate this kind of cosmetic damage. 
uh, and eat it. You know, you just peel it and eat the rest. Commercially, uh, organic or conventional producers, this is trash. Okay, this will not sell. Okay, but for a homeowner, you have to uh, change your standards. I mean, this is what grandma used to harvest and eat. Uh, they uh, they don't uh, never harvested and ate a beautiful fruit that did not have an insect sting or a hole or a tomato with a small uh, rotten piece. Uh, that is uh, the name of the game. Or you go and spray uh, strong insecticides uh, and spray regularly if you, or buy them from the store if you're not willing to accept something that looks like that. They taste, they still taste it great. Just peel them if you don't like them. June 21st, I did my tomato harvest. Um, I thought uh, yeah, maybe, you know, of course, this is too late. Uh, remember, I planted them too late, uh, so my uh, harvest was uh, too late. I'll show you some pictures not of, of some of the varieties. HT2 is heat tolerant. This is a breeding variety by Dr. Uh, Crosby, the uh, tomato breeder on main campus. He sent me some seeds. Uh, it looks great, very smooth. Uh, but uh, this here is the crack that I mentioned earlier. And here's the beginning of a crack from overwatering. Uh, because this skin is like a plastic bag it does not uh, cannot expand too fast if you overwater and what you see here the uh, gold dust like a golden specks here that's uh, mite feeding damage no sting bugs uh, just a lot of problem with mites this year HM8849, that's another beefsteak variety, big size, uh, good yielder, did not, uh, did not have as much uh, uh, mite damage as the uh, as HD2, um, but uh, some of them had the fruit worm. See, the fruit worm went inside, ate, but, I, but then must have hatched and left out because it's not there and I don't see any indication. Uh, of uh, so well, came in came out ruined the fruit skyway 687 that's uh, available on the market big size big beef steak uh, tribeca uh, that looked like uh, the most going to be the heaviest yielder uh, big fruits uh, uh, very smooth skin uh, of course all of these are not ideal you see my damage you see uneven ripening just uh, very hot and uh, terrible weather this year. Not a good year for growing tomato. Uh, Thunderbird, also uh, big size, uh, beautiful fruits. I mean, all of these were edible, but for a homeowner, not a commercial. I mean, you cannot even sell these at a farmer's market because uh, people still want something that looks pretty. Not with these yeah, lines and cracks or dust or may think they want the ideal tomato, but they also want it organic and nothing sprayed. Those two cannot uh, mix together. Okay, they cannot go together. As a homeowner, you have to lower your standard and accept that these, uh, they, if they look ugly, just uh, make sauce out of them and they will uh, taste just as well. And you see uh, big fruit. This one here is almost 15 ounces, and this one is one pound, one ounce, you know, 17 ounces. Big, beautiful fruit. And this is the total yield of uh, my tomato harvest. These numbers here in the bold brackets, inside brackets, are the number of harvests, uh, total number of fruits, and total yield. And I average the number, uh, the yield per plant. So you may think that 56 pounds of HM8849 out of two harvest is wow, fantastic, but that's 11 pounds. And that's every fruit is consumable. A, for a commercial, I bet you zero would be sold because they looked ugly. You know, uh, Remember, consumer, uh, I mean, producer, commercial producer versus a homeowner, it's a different uh, game, different perspective, different standards. But 56 pounds out of five plants, that's 11 pounds per plant. That is too low. Look, at, and that's the best yielder. Look, I had anywhere between 11 to half a pound per plant. Um, this is terrible year. I transplanted late. It, uh, the mites uh, terminated the season early for me. 
uh, I've had 20, 25 pounds uh, of uh, some uh, like the hot TY in the past, uh, or even the Ruby Crush, I've had uh, upwards of 20 pounds per plant. So anyway, um, uh, listed from uh, top to bottom, uh, the, uh, the beef steaks were the biggest yielder, and I had two to three yields. Uh, hot TY and Ruby Crush were early. Uh, UV58 and UV32, those are heat tolerant, potentially heat tolerant varieties, so they came in early, so they have potential. Uh, so take some record, uh, take uh, write down the date and how much you harvested so you have an idea. Did you harvest four times or one time? Four times tells you that you uh, started early, so maybe that's what you want versus one that, um, you know, a one time harvest. Okay, um, and uh, have a variety of crepe, cherry, uh, beef steak. Um, uh, that's um, to, to for for the taste, for the cooking, different recipes. So anyway, um, I'm not happy with the yields at all. Um, even though uh, I mean, you see, 50s, 40s, 30 pounds, but average per plant is is, is very low. And uh, the only way you can tell you are a good gardener is if you have yield, because most gardeners live in a fantasy that they had the, uh, plenty of tomatoes, oh, they fed their neighbors, but if, unless you know your yield per plant, you don't know if uh, you had a poor year like this, and there's room for improvement, because you should easily get 15 pounds per plant uh, 20 pounds per plant on some of the um, beefsteak varieties. If you're not there, then there's room for improvement. And if you can get more yield per plant, you can plant fewer plants in the garden and, uh, you know, have room for uh, plant another crop. So keep that in mind. If I want 100 pounds, then I need 10 plants, okay, of HM8849. But if I have uh, 20 pounds per plant, then I need only five plants. Then I have room, I, I plant half the number of plants, and I have room to plant something else. Uh, because remember, most gardeners, they are your limited space. You don't have an acre to plant in, so you want to maximize the number of crops you can plant in this garden. June 23rd, remember, uh, all is well. On June 5th, look what uh, two weeks later, three weeks later did when uh, mites uh, get out of control. And I believe this is a video on uh, the uh, mites and the kabocha. I hope you remember uh, in the earlier slides how the uh, uh, kabocha looked like. Let's watch together how they look now three weeks later. This is the kabocha plant that I built on a trellis and I'm losing the battle to mites. You really have to look closely, but this speckling is typical. This uh, damage this year has been very dry, very uh, hot quickly, and no rain. There, nothing I can spray now will, will save the plants. I have a few fruits I would like to harvest first, and then destroy the plants. There's one here. There's one here. This is ready. Look at that, beautiful. This one is stuck inside the cage. And here's another indication of the uh, mites. I hope you can see it. You see this little webbing here? That is all mites. Here's another one. That's ready. So, unfortunately, I... but what's interesting is that the mites like the kabocha more than the cantaloupe. Those two over there, 
doing very well very nice and green nothing sprayed differently whereas look at how poor these are as a gardener don't be the eternal optimist I'm gonna get better it'll get better I'll spray it'll get better sometimes you lose the battle and admit your loss and dig up the plant and move on so I'm not gonna wait for these plants to like this one has one good one and one two three four and many flowers so all I'm gonna get out of this one is this one fruit and destroy the rest of the plant okay lesson learned spray more often Well, I realized with kabocha is that even the small unripe fruit are edible. Uh, I guess just like the loofah, uh, they, they are edible. Uh, so I harvested everything, uh, even the small, what I would consider uh, immature fruit. And I had a total of 25 fruits with a total yield of about 54 pounds. So that's not bad out of uh, seven, eight plants. Uh, but uh, it could have been double that if uh, if I had the mites under uh, control. So like I said in the video, lesson learned, um, spray more regular. Um, uh, gardening is a full-time job, not uh, once a week walk around and uh, uh, every day uh, half hour of work minimum. Uh, you can stay on top of things. Now, mites were uh, also a serious problem on tomatoes, and this is a typical uh, damage, the speckling, and it looks like uh, someone sprinkled gold dust uh, on, uh, to, on the tomatoes. Okay, it's still edible, nothing wrong with it, doesn't affect the taste. Um, it's uh, unlike uh, sting bugs where uh, it can feel gritty on the inside and the, and the yellow spots are much bigger. These are fine, tiny little uh, spots, uh, you know, dots 
um, doesn't affect the flavor, doesn't affect uh, the taste. Um, and some of them may look uh, look so pretty actually, but this is definitely mild damage, even on the large beefsteak varieties. Uh, that's a typical uh, mite. But uh, the way I uh, cook my tomatoes, uh, even in a salad, I uh, uh, peel. You know, I cut a X here and drop it in the boiling water so that I can peel the skin and eat on the inside, uh, eat the inside. Because uh, most uh, home gardeners, uh, the fruit quality is poor, like this one, but the fruit taste inside is, is still good. So peel it. Yeah, and whether cook it or still use it uh, in a in a salad uh, or in a stew is still fine. Uh, July 2nd, I did a one-time harvest of all the peppers. Uh, I realized, like I mentioned earlier, that the, uh, the rabbits are starting and they will bite here on this end where the seeds are and f eat all the seeds and leave the rest. And they had no problem with super hot spicy uh, uh, peppers. I guess they don't have our taste buds and they don't care for capsaicin. Uh, but they're going after the protein that's in the seeds. So I decided to do a one-time harvest. Uh, some were very early, as you can see, some have. Uh, and in terms of yield, some uh, were uh, still very low yielder and it had a lot of fruits. So um, I know that I'll be doing uh, more harvest. And I'm showing you the pictures here in terms of the biggest yielders. This is red cherry. And by the way, this here, the distance between these two lines is one inch. So that gives you an idea that these are about two inches, two to two and a half to three inches uh, long. This was red cherry, very hot. Um, Charleston hot. So if this is one inch here, so one, two, three, three to four inches long, also hot. Um, I don't like spicy peppers. I'm telling you anecdotal of what other people told me that they told me it tasted just as hot as uh, jalapeno, but a different flavor, of course. And you see they have different colors. They start yellow. This one starts yellow directly. It doesn't start green. Starts yellow and starts, uh, you know, turns orange and mixture of yellow and orange and then red. And so like this will be the most mature when it's solid red. And this is Diablo Grande, a variety of uh, jalapeno, and I put them here from left to right uh, in terms of ripening. You see they start green, then brownish green, then purple brown, and dark brown, then reddish brown, then red, then wrinkled red. Like this is definitely overripe. Um, I think commercially they like the jalapeno to have, you know, start seeing the lines on it and then either green or red depending on the variety. And if this is one inch, then these are about two inches long and they were very, very spicy. Uh, Diablo Grande means big devil. Sweet pepper pimento, these are three inches long by two inches wide, uh, sweet. Uh, you know, cone type uh, uh, pepper um, and not a big yielder and not really very impressive because it looked like it has too much uh, seed, uh, very little flesh to seed ratio, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yellow Jamaican, uh, this was, was interesting. You had like three, four, five fruits stuck together, so like in a bundle. Uh, and you see different uh, grades of, you can do a one-time harvest. I, some people like uh, green, some people like red. The darker and the more mature it, it is, the more spicy it is. So like this one, more than this, more than this, more than that. Okay, and these are about uh, two to three inches long, yellow jimmy. Eclipse, this was definitely should have been harvested much earlier because uh, most of the fruits look like they were uh, beyond uh, ripe. I mean, they wrinkled. But uh, remember, uh, in many uh, European countries, uh, they harvest the pepper and they store them and dry them. Because that goes into, this is not garbage. This is goes into stew and cooking and still have the flavor and still has the spiciness and still has all that. So uh, you can uh, pick uh, peppers green uh, if you like them and you can wait till they ripen and you can even leave them way past their life shelf life to dry out completely 
and store them for uh, cooking over the winter. None of these are, are a waste. All of these are still uh, all of the pepper harvest. Hungarian yellow wax, beautiful fruits, uh, you know, uh, three to four inches. Um, beautiful colors, different shades of colors, uh, you know, just like a like a palette of color, very beautiful. A Keystone Resistant Giant, uh, this is the only one I grew that's typical of, uh, you know, the bell pepper shape, where you had four lobes or three lobes. And by the way, you may hear about the four lobe is a female fruit and the three lobe is a male fruit. This is uh, folklore. This is um, uh, not science. Uh, the, this is not male and uh, is not male or female. It's a fruit. Okay, so I don't know. Chefs may call them uh, female, and it's better for fresh salad. And uh, and uh, male with the three lobes is better for cooking. Maybe it's better for cooking, or maybe it's fresh, but male and female, this is just not science. Yeah, you decide if you want to believe that or not. Uh, guajillo, that was uh, really long, so this is one inch, four to five inches long. Uh, you see the, the different grades of ripening from the green to the super red, and uh, very spicy. Uh, New Mexico Mirasol, shorter, all of these uh, were spicy early jalapeno they were short you know two inches long uh, I don't know if it's because I planted them close you know I planted my peppers one foot by one foot spacing so in one one bed that was four by 17 foot long I had nine varieties and nine times five I had 45 plants so you know they were crowded which is not the best way to get the top yield per plant but a great way to test a lot of varieties in a small area and see which one you like so that next year you can plant them a little bit more space a little bit bigger. or you may be happy with the yields that you're getting per plant as long as they are crowded el rey jalapeno uh, was a very good producer no insect no disease problems and you know uh, anywhere between two and a half to three inches uh, tall and a different gradation I think this will be the one that will be considered commercially acceptable because for jalapeno uh, commercial growers like to see these uh, lines on it which are just natural crack that's not a disease or insect or mites it's just natural crack of the skin as it expands and it tells you that it's ripe like these but all of these are edible and can be harvested just some people like more flavor and, and definitely this will taste better uh, different than the green one uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, this is not edible, the green one. El Jefe Jalapeno, uh, I did not see cracks on these, on any of the fruits, uh, no matter how red they were. Maybe it's just that uh, variety. But uh, again, same about same size, two to three inches. Candy cane, this is the one that had, uh, you know, the shape was unique. Uh, a lot of ridges in it, uh, beautiful uh, the degradation of color you know, three to four inches by two to three inches uh, wide, uh, uh, sweet pepper, one of the few sweet pepper varieties I planted. Thai dragon was one of the lowest yielder because it's still early. The plants are very tall and uh, they're going to produce more. Hopefully in future updates, I'll give you the total yield. Uh, but for now, let me show you uh, my current yield that I harvested. I'm listing these from the highest yielder uh, in terms of total yield. This is total yield, not per plant. This is total yield from five plants from top to bottom. So sweet pepper pimento, I harvested 119 fruits, 5.4 pounds, 58 fruits, 67, Charleston hot, 220 fruits, 2.4 pounds. So you know that they are uh, small fruits maybe because they were crowd, uh, crowded these here the ones one pound 0 0.9 0 0.3 I am sure that these are the first harvest there will be more I will have more harvest here also but looking at the plants I don't see as much uh, flowers on the plants as much as much as I see here but there is hope because we know and I know and you should know that in pepper, when you remove the fruits, 
you encourage f f uh, new flower formation. So I'm hoping that once I harvested and stripped uh, these uh, plants of 95% of their fruits, I'm going to encourage more uh, flowers. So these have the potential to uh, flower and set again. These I know I will harvest again two or three times because they are still loaded with flowers. Hopefully in future presentation, I'll give you an updated uh, total yield list here. On July 5, which is the just a couple of days ago, uh, the uh, cantaloupes are looking great. Uh, the ones high are protected. And like I said, I was surprised that even if this fruit that weighs uh, three pounds is still hanging by itself, there's no need for support. But anything within one foot of the ground uh, is being fed on by the rabbits. Um, final thoughts, let's watch this video together. Uh, this is the last video I took uh, yesterday. Um, and, uh, and let's watch it together. A tour of the garden. Okay, it's July 6th. This is the time to end crops and start other crops and renovate the garden and this is mid-season so that is when the garden should look at its worst and this is the mark of a good gardener uh, not early in the season anybody's garden looks uh, nice early in the season in april and may show me your garden in, in june july end of june early july and then I can tell you if you're a good gardener or, uh, or, or not. Like this is not. Look at these tomatoes. The rabbits ate the fruits and the mites took care of the rest. All this you see here is mite damage. I've shown you that before in earlier videos. And of course I'm trying to be as uh, close to nature as possible. Spray. Uh, organic natural stuff like uh, insecticidal soap and that's what you get okay you want a garden for fun or you want to garden to eat if you want to garden to eat then you gotta play with the big leagues and get uh, strong pesticides and spray regularly or organic pesticides and spray regularly I've been told one time, oh, I want to be like grandma. You want to be like grandma? This is what you get. I think uh, I got the equivalent of maybe 20% of total yield. Because if you want to fight with nature, nature will win. Of course, this is uh, a stressful year, not a typical year. Um, dry and hot very early, which exploded the number of mites and another reason the mites exploded is I kept spraying insecticides you know my insecticidal soap which killed the predators of the mites so keep that in mind you spray insecticide you gotta spray something for mites this variety here is uh, indeterminate as you can see it's still growing still growing um, but all those that you see over there are determined. They reach top height and they quit. Anyway, this is the cleanup. Next time we meet here, I'll show you a video where I cleaned it up. That's the project for today. Remove the string, remove the plant, clean it up as soon as possible um, because I'm not eating from it, but bugs and insects and weeds and all, all this are still eating of it. And I don't want worse problems than before. And it's a time to inspect the roots of the plant to see if there's any, any sign of if the root look healthy or I have any signs of uh, root rot nematode. That's how nice healthy roots should look like. If you see any beads on them, then you have root rot nematode. So that's an opportunity to inspect the plants at cleaning time. I harvested the peppers, peppers did great, rabbits uh, also um, uh, ate a lot of my yield, 
Of course, these are planted a little thick. I mean, this uh, four by 20, four by 17 foot bed had nine varieties, five plants each. They planted one by uh, one, one foot by one foot spacing. So each plant is small, but and the yield is small per plant, but I have more plants per square foot. So this is a great uh, way to uh, test uh, many varieties in your garden, see which one you like, before you switch to one or two, instead of planting them two feet apart, two by two, and get bigger plants and waste the prime real estate that you have. Like this Keystone Giant, uh, look at all the sunburn. So that may not be suited. But uh, even this one here, which is Mirasol, also have a lot uh, of sunburn at the top. But Charleston Hut, no, no sunburn at all. And they're nice. This variety is Guajillo, very nice. Very nice. Uh, I had some jalapenos, three jalapeno varieties. So I did a one time harvest, but, but some are coming back. This is doing really nice. It uh, looks like it's a late season, took a while to get established. I had very little harvest, but look at all this bloom. So later I'm gonna have, this is Thai dragon, and that's how the fruit looks like. You like very hot spicy peppers and here's another jalapeno so they did well that's a way of growing your peppers so nine and nine and this is one variety so 18 varieties uh, in three beds planted one by one there's a foot apart I'm not planting kale again because all I'm doing is feeding the cabbage worms. I spray and next day I see the moth, the butterfly flying. So I'm tired of, so all I do is harvest it and throw it away because it looks ugly. Swiss chard is doing great. No bugs, no insects, no diseases. You just have to, for one person or for a family, this is too many Swiss charts. Too many Swiss chard. A large family, or for sale in the farmer's market, or share with your friends, that's plenty. I think for me, maybe three plants would be enough for a family of two. Next is the three varieties of, cab of uh, squash. I've shown you earlier how I thinned and trimmed all the old leaves, which is a great way but now the mites came in. It looks like they finished with the tomatoes. They moved here. So this is the end of the season, but uh, I harvested a lot. This is Pantheon variety, which is an Italian Muscara type. Fruit looks like this, few seeds, delicious. And this is zucchini, the regular green zucchini. Here's the fruit over there. I noticed that all of the four varieties, except this zucchini, uh, had uh, a squash vine border when I was cleaning the lower leaves, and I used the razor blade uh, to kill the vine, uh, kill the worm inside the vine. That's probably the best way. And this is yellow crookneck squash, very prolific. Uh, probably harvested the most out of the four varieties. So this is what I mean by removing the lower leaves and I can remove some more as the plant is getting bigger uh, and that's the opportunity to see where that worm was and I got it cleaned it uh, of course it would be nice if you can bury the stem like I mentioned before if you dig a hole and bury the stem here then uh, you um, you can cover the stem to let, so that the worm does not go in and also have that stem root and get established. So all of those, if they were covered, 
would have helped the plant. But right now I'm fighting a losing battle with the mites towards the end of the season. I want to plant uh, summer crops. So I decided not to do anything and call these plants. So in a week or two, I'm going to call these plants and plant something else. Magda variety of squash. It's called Magda. It's a calabasa squash. Looks like looks like this. That was the preferred of all four here at the center. People loved it. They were picking this the most. Very aggressive, grows very fast. It's a vine type. I also thinned a lot of leaves. Look how much leaves I thinned there. See the spike here? And and uh, it's still very big. So um, it's a vine type. Rabbits. Rabbits ate all my sweet potatoes that I planted here. All the parsley that I planted there, but they don't like uh, cilantro. Anyway, uh, when I planted these about a month ago, this was too late to plant parsley and cilantro. <coughs> so uh, if you want to do this, you have to put uh, white fabric or some shade cloth over it to reduce the heat stress. I mean, they're growing, they're growing, but uh, um, very stressed very stressed, barely growing. They need cool weather or some kind of uh, shade cloth over them to protect them. The other day I used this uh, fan sprinkler that you see here to, uh, to uh, for like three, four hours uh, water the garden, simulate rainfall, cool the plant, moisten the soil, Hopefully kill a lot of the mites. The kabocha squash that was on, on these three trellises are gone. They were the first to be infected with the mites. So I harvested about 30 pounds of uh, kabocha squash. And interestingly, the mites don't like or the, uh, the cantaloupe is resistant to, to mites or they prefer or they prefer squash versus mites. So who knows if I did not have, I only had cantaloupe, I'm sure I would have had more mites. But anyway, this trail is doing great. Cantaloupe doing great. This one on the ground is doing great. And of course, that's what you get when you have rabbits in the garden. I'll leave it so that they pay, focus their attention on this. This is ready, but it's stuck, so I'll have to harvest it, but it's stuck inside the trellis. I'll have to cut it in half. Look at the size of this one. And I'm surprised that uh, they're supporting their own weight, so I'm happy. Cantaloupe are doing great. This is a great way to grow. Uh, lots of fruit. You see here, lots of fruits. <laughs> Lots of fruits. So, cantaloupe is a success. And that's it.